as Janelle mentioned, it's called uh, using data for Connect Home USA. What we should have said was using census data for Connect Home USA. Um, we are very fortunate to have two experts on data who will help us understand where the latest data from the census can be found, how that data relates and describes what's happening on the ground in terms of broadband availability in your community and how you can use that data to help you plan your Connect Home USA work and also prepare funding proposals. So let me introduce our first speaker. Tyson Weister is a program analyst in the Census Bureau's communications team for data.census.gov, the new site to access census data. In this role, he trains users to access data through the site with specialized expertise in the American Community Survey Statistics. Tyson has a bachelor's degree, or sorry, bachelor's degrees in economics and public affairs, along with a master's degree in communication. And Tyson will be followed by Amy Tseng, who is a senior broadband program specialist with the National Telecommunications and Information Administration's Broadband USA program. She works primarily with local and state governments, provides technical assistance on digital inclusion and smart communities programs and strategies, and has a bachelor's degree in math and physics and a master's degree in technology and policy. We are very excited to have both of them with us today. And without further ado, I will now turn it over to Tyson. Thank you. Great, Tina, and thank you all for joining this afternoon. Um, we are really excited to share some information that I think you all will find really valuable. Uh, at the end of the present today, our goal is to make sure that you all walk out feeling comfortable if you're not already familiar with what the American Community Survey is, specifically a little bit more detail on where our questions come from for computer and internet use, and then most important, how to access the data on the brand new site data.census.gov. In the past, you may have accessed this data through American Fact Finder. We are rolling out a new site to access the American Community Survey data, so this will mainly focus on the live demonstration with information We'll more about application when I turn it over to our next co presenter But to go ahead and get started, what is the American Community Survey? Most people know us at the Census Bureau for counting the population every 10 years. American Community Survey is something that we've been doing on an annual basis since 2005. It's the largest household survey in the world, and we have the most current, reliable, and accessible data source for local statistics. So we uh, cover a lot of similar topics that other federal surveys and programs cover, but what sets the ACS apart is our ability to produce that information for small geographic areas down to the neighborhood or census tract level and small population groups. Our survey is based off of a half million sample address every year, and we collect over 40 different topics. So not only can you look at data for those topics individually, things like in access, computer ownership, and income, but you can also look at cross populations for those topics. We'll see what that looks like on the live site on data.census.gov. And then as a note, we do have three annual data releases each year. One year estimates are for geographies with populations of 65,000 or more, and our five year estimates are for all geographies regardless of the population size. And that bullet in the middle that you see on the bottom of the screen is a mid sized geography. For today, we're going to focus a little bit on the ABS five-year estimates, a picture of what geographies the American Community Survey has to offer. Um, we have a slide here showing some of the more common geographic areas you can see from the nation. The American Community Survey produces data all the way down to the block group level that you see here on this slide. And any of the geographic areas where you see connected by direct lines means that it's meet in the higher level geographies or it's nested together. So as an example, um, congressional districts always fit neatly within state boundaries, but don't necessarily have a relationship to metropolitan areas or places. With, we do have computer and internet use data that we've been collecting since 2013. And the great thing that relates to the five-year estimates is that we have new data for the five-year estimates that we released for the first time last year on December 6th of 2018. 
those were based on the data collected from the five-year period of time, 2013 to 2017. So that's the first time that you've been able to get this data for all geographic areas. And we'll try to access that on the site. Before we get into that, just to give you an overview of the different ways you can access American Community Survey across the board, today we're going to focus on data.census.gov, the new platform to access American Community Survey data. You can also access these data through this application programming interface or API, our transfer profile site, if you'd like to download all of the data in bulk. You do have access to American Fact Finder until early 2020. So that existing eight five-year data that we just showcased on the last slide for you, that will be available through American Fact Finder, but no new data will be delivered to the site, and you'll only be able to access data on AFF until early 2020. Well, we'd like to highlight that there's lots of different tables from the American Community Survey. It, it can seem overwhelming if it's your first time getting into the data, given that we push 11 billion estimates live every year. Will you, in particular, two tables on the site that I think you're going to love, S2801 and S2802. They cover um, a lot of different ways of looking at computer and Internet use across different topics and provides estimates as well as percentages. But where does this data come from? Well, there are three questions on the American Community Survey that ask about computer and Internet use. For that, you can see on the left-hand side, this is what the first question looks like, question 10. For household level, we ask if folks pay for an Internet subscription. is if they have access, maybe without paying for it themselves. And the third box is do not have access at all that, we're able to tabulate data that you'll see in just a moment. But in combination with this, you can look at the ways that folks have access. So on the right-hand side on question 11, you can look whether they have access to the Internet through their cell phone plan, broadband, the light dial-up, or some other service. And of course, some folks may have access to the Internet through more than one. As an example, access to the Internet through their cell phone plan, as well as the broadband Internet subscription at their home. Just to a high-level look at uh, this data from the 2013-2017 ACS five-year estimate, since we'll be kind of comparing some of this across smaller geographies, you get a high level that 70.1% of folks have an Internet subscription and 21.3% do not. And you can see some of the breakouts that are provided across this data. You can look at that, that have, as an example, Act through a mobile data plan, being 49.3%. Or if you wanted to focus in on folks that only have access through their cell phone, you can see that number in our data tabulations on data.census.gov. Another question for computer ownership, pretty simple here. We ask whether they folks have top, laptop, smartphone, tablet, or some other device. And then similarly, folks may be able to check more the combination as yes, so you can kind of look at the types of devices, whether a person on a very high level has access to one or more computing devices versus no computer at all, and the breakouts of folks who have access to particular devices and then folks who only have access through that particular type of device. So let's focus on how you can access the data. It's already been paid for and funded through tax dollars, so um, it's free on our site. We point out that we're transitioning from American Fact Finder to data.census.gov. Just to give you a little bit of background about this transition, um, driven by a model that wasn't working out so well for Census Bureau data users, we had collected, processed, edit, and reviewed information. In 1994, we launched census.gov. And then in the right side of this picture, you can see we disseminated that data by organically developing hundreds of tools and applications like American Fact Finder, Quick Facts, Ferret. And you as a user had to know to go to these separate sites to access the information. You had to take time to learn each individual site. And the skills learned in accessing census data in one site weren't necessarily transferable in helping you access data in another site. 
With that, we're moving towards a new model here at the bottom where we can use to collect, process, edit, and review quality information, put it out in time through the Census Application Programming Interface, and feed it to you on data.census.gov where you can search for the information in one location. So the long-term vision being streamlining your access, putting things in one place, uh, helping us do things more efficiently as well. As what we're showcasing today, um, it's the usual way to start accessing Census Bureau data, but it's by no means a final site. It's only to get better and better, and the way that you'll see that are continuous improvements put out live every month based on user feedback. So with that, let's go ahead and swap over here to the live demo on data. Census.gov, and you're uh, welcome to follow along on screen. Give just one minute, and I'll get right back over here to the site. Okay, so with data.census.gov, there are multiple pathways to get to the end result data that you're looking for. You'll notice that through the free form search box up here at the top, as well as the advanced search button here. I'm going to introduce you to a few different ways to go about searching for data. We'll look at some things, customize our table view, and map it so you should feel comfortable starting to navigate and explore the site specifically for computer and internet use data. My favorite place to get started is the single search bar. Type in keywords and codes, things like topic, geography, or table ID if you know it, and it's a great way to quickly get to what you may be looking for. So in this example, we'll pull up data for San Francisco County, California, and here, so with that topic plus the geography, so the list of results. This is the all results page that gives us a preview of different options available. I like to click right into tables, ending at some of the data that we choose from. On the left-hand side, we can see there are 66 table results. We can scroll through the list. Thing loads in sections, so we can kind of click load more. We can click very nicely between table title and start seeing in view the right-hand side of our screen as to what type of data that table has to offer. If you narrow this down a bit, you do have the filter button here available to you to specify additional search criteria. One trick you can go about to narrow your results is to type in the table ID. In case we mentioned S2802 as one example of subject table from the American Community Survey that has those percentages and estimates and a nice look about that topic. So we narrowed our result down to that one individual table and then customize table in the upper right. That's just to bring across our full screen so you get a nice view. So this, um, we can see we get data for the total population in the county. We see data for folks that have a broadband internet subscription in terms of estimates, as well as the corresponding percent broadband internet subscription. The same kind of repeating process totals folks without an internet subscription, the percent, and folks that don't have a computer in their household at all. So to make this view a little clearer, so you can kind of see what this table has to offer. I'm going to get rid of a couple columns by adding the margin of error. For now, we do recommend that you look at it when you're using the estimates, but just see what this table has. And I'm going to remove the estimates as well. So we'll just look at percents to get a view as to what the data has to offer. Another thing where shaded, you can expand and collapse the columns. So what this tells us in San Francisco County, there's approximately 864,000 households, 91.5 have broadband internet subscription, 0.1% without an internet subscription, and 4.3% with no computer in the household. So we could, if we're interested in a particular demographic group, such as 65 years and over, as you maybe would expect, there's 0.5% with broadband internet, 8.8% without, and then 19.3% without a computer in the household. We can get these characteristics across age, 
race, educational attainment, employment status, just from this one table. And keep in mind, we did have 66 tables in our results. So your ability to explore this data across different groups is available to you. I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and focus on the alternative pathway to go about accessing the data. And what's really the benefit of the ACS five-year estimates is getting this down to the neighborhood level. So maybe you wanted to look at small areas within San Francisco County and where there may be higher concentrations of folks that don't have access to the internet. We'll show you how you can go about doing that. First thing I'm going to do is click on the U.S. Census Bureau logo in the upper left. That's going to clear out everything I've done, take back to the landing page. I'm going to use the advanced search, but before we get there, I've pulled up another tab here to one of the geography resources. It's called the Census Geocoder, and this allows you to do is find a particular census tract associated with an address. So in this poll, I'm going to walk through how to find the census tract associated with 125 West Point Road. And to that, I'm first going to click where it says geography. Um, geographies using option S. So this can type in that single address. And the reason we're using this address is because there's a real life use application for how this data has been used in order to benefit the community surrounding this address. And he's going to talk more about that in just a moment. In 125 West Point Road. San Francisco, California, and code. Done that. Click, click find, and then it gives you different geographies associated with the address. I look here up at the top for the layer. And give just one moment. It looks like I have a typo somewhere. Okay, I apologize for that. Sometimes you do want to play around. That was my mistake where I abbreviated. In this case, it is helpful to spell out West. So if you're getting the exact result you want, uh, you try kind of playing around with the abbreviations in order to get the match. Here we can see as we scroll down get the different geographies, and we for the one that says census tract. So once we find census tract, what I do is go over to where it says name, and that gives you the nice clean label that you would be able to pick from the system on data.census.gov. So we see this address falls within Census Tract 231.03 in San Francisco County. So now ready to go about the advanced search, it's how you can get to things like Census Tract and Metro Area, or just an alternative way to go about searching. So to get started, maybe you want to specify whatever is most important. These build off of each other. So I click years. We're getting the most recent data from the end of the ACS for 2013 to 2017, five-year estimates. And then go ahead and specify some geographies. So as we work our way through this step-by-step -step approach, what we're looking for is a checkbox as a final selection or to add it to our filters here in the lower left. So starting here with tract, going through the prompts, we click California. Then scroll down until we get to San Francisco County. And then it loads all of the tracks within that county. In the left, I like to click on the spyglass. And you only need three characters to start doing your search here. So just by typing in 231, we can see the second result has populated census tract 231.03 in San Francisco County. Maybe I'm going to compare this estimate for in subscription to higher level geography, we'll say county, California, and Francisco County. Did an alternative way to have it into the single search bar earlier. 
we get the data to the state. As overall U.S. estimate. In this session, we could continue to select geographies that we're interested in. I want to move to find our topic. And collect it at the household level, so we go into housing. physical characteristic of the household. So, so anytime you have to learn this for the first time, it is helpful to explore the options that are available to you, but this is the pathway to select telephone, computer, internet access. Once we've all of our selections, we can click more. There we've selected exactly what we want, nothing more, nothing less, and then click start on the right. Move to the tables. In this case, we're going to look at S2801. I would customize table again in the right. Here we can start looking at the data available. To make the again, we'll go ahead and click on my side. And I'm check the boxes that say total so we can focus on honing in on the percents across these different geographies, especially since the total population across these geographies are drastically different. This will give us a better look of comparison. This other table, we could look at folks' type of computer or computer availability in the household. I want to get to the without internet subscription data, so I'm going to click the on the side types of computers to hide the sections of the table that I'm not interested in. So as we can see without an internet subscription, we pair across these different geographies. So we can see in the census tract we selected, 35.7% of households do not have an internet subscription versus 15.1% for the county, 6.9% for the state, or 21.3% the U.S. overall. So this is very good information maybe if you're writing a grant application to be able to compare across these geographies. You'd be interested in mapping to visually look across geographies as well. My favorite way to get there is to click tables in the upper left and then navigate very seamlessly between tables and maps to map out this individual estimate. Now it's recognized that one of our selections is at the census tract level. It's in our layer of the map to say census tract as we can see in the upper right and zoomed us specifically to the tract we selected. And we'll be adding checkboxes that will allow you to select collections of census tracts, like all of the census tracts in San Francisco County in one click. Until that's there, though, you do have the option to individually click on geographies and select them on your map. Or use this rectangle selection tool in the lower right to pick a small collection of census tracts and update your map for comparison. Optimize map now in the upper right. The only thing that's left to do is everything's based on the table. And default is mapping out the very first line of the table. So it's mapping out the total number of households in the census tract. All we have to do is where it says data variable, click that drop down. And it loads in sections. So what I like to do is continuously scroll to the bottom to make sure we've loaded all of the possible variables that we may want to map. This one, if you have the first set of estimates, it maps out the total estimate, and then it repeats all of those variables a second time. So what I'm looking for is actually the second instance of where it says type. Let me look first. The internet subscriptions without an internet subscription estimate because it's the second instance and it's the second column of the table, that is what's to map out the percent for you. And you can see that's reflected here in the legend on the left that we have clearly mapped out percent. And tracks with darker shades of blue have higher percent of households without internet subscription in comparison to the other geographies. So our census tracked the 231.03. The 35.7% of folks in that census tract do internet subscription or 
this other tract in darker shade of blue that census tract 9805.01 is approaching 50% without internet subscription. So this includes the demo of data.census.gov. Every do does depend on your feedback. So as you work through the site, you may have ideas on how we can better serve you. Please let us know by emailing us bedside.feedback at census.gov. What we're able to show today was a brief introduction, but there is a one-stop for educational resources to learn more. So please take a look at that. With that, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Emmy. Hello. Thanks so much for that. Um, that was formative, and I'm just learning myself, so that, that was great. Um, just waiting to get, oh yes, okay, there I am. And do we need anything? Uh, I'll see if I have control over the screen. Okay, um, so um, again, thank you, Dina, for inviting me to speak today. Um, as um, I'm Yitzung, and um, as was mentioned, I work at the U.S. Department of Commerce um, at National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Um, so my focus really is on helping local communities with their digital inclusion strategies to increase broadband adoption, use, and digital skills. Um, I provide advice on planning and funding and implementation and stakeholder engagements, um, as well as other strategies. Uh, I do want to give a caveat, despite my somewhat nerdy educational background, I don't um, necessarily consider myself a data and mapping expert. Um, people like Tyson, you know, they, there are a lot of people who know a lot more about the specifics of the data um, itself. My, my focus is on policies and programs, and, and in this arena, it's really, I use this data a lot um, when I, I engage with communities, and what I like to think about my role is almost a translator or somebody who can like help figure out what kinds of questions and what questions to ask um, and what can be answered with uh, data. So um, again, the whole point of this part of the presentation is show you some examples on how you can use this data for your own uh, planning and, uh, and uh, funding um, purposes. I'll start by giving a short overview um, about our agency. Um, the, uh, so NTIA is part of the uh, U.S. Department of Commerce, uh, similar to, uh, to Census, and NTIA is responsible for advising the executive branch on telecommunications and information policy issues. Our initiative cover broadband policy and assistance through the Broadband USA program, which is where I work, uh, spectrum policy, uh, internet policy, which covers things like digital privacy, the internet of things, the digital economy, as well as internet governance, as well as public safety. Um, so you might have uh, worked with or know about FirstNet which is the first responder uh, network authority, a nationwide public safety broadband network. So um, oftentimes we're confused with the FCC, but the FCC is a regulatory agency, and ultimately it uh, answers to Congress. Um, really, uh, we are, as part of the uh, Department of Commerce, we are an executive um, agency. More about Broadband USA itself. Um, Broadband USA, the uh, the initiative uh, supports committee efforts to increase broadband access and digital inclusion in the following ways: help educate state and local leaders um, by providing guides and tools. We also prevent, uh, present a monthly webinar on a variety of related topics. Uh, we hold convenings and we bring together key stakeholders, both in person and online, um, and really help uh, facilitate conversations amongst government entities, uh, again, at all levels, from local to federal, industry, nonprofits, and advocacy groups. Um, in fact, we are having a, a workshop this uh, this Friday, I think, in um, 
in Nevada, and we we hold again a lot of workshops um, throughout the country, as well as um, we have we facilitate online meetings. We also offer more direct uh, technical assistance program, which I actually specifically work on, and we um, work with either individual communities or groups of communities to really help inform and advise them, um, again, on the broadband and digital inclusion efforts. So um, when I refer to digital inclusion, I really mean um, uh, the part of the whole broadband field that encompasses internet, um, um, internet usage, uh, promoting access access to computers and internet devices, digital skills, relevant content and applications, as well as community and technical support. Of course, this uh, presentation we be focused mainly on, and we will be focusing, I will be focusing mainly on the American Community Survey, but I just want to let you know um, about a couple other federal data sources that uh, does provide information about broadband availability, adoptions, uh, uh, broadband adoption, i.e. broadband subscription rates, and computer ownership. So the FCC uh, collects data on broadband availability, providers, and broadband adoption fr uh, directly from the internet services service providers uh, through their 477 form. Um, they've actually aggregated um, a subscription data from the providers, uh, and that's available on their website. But now that we have this five-year data, um, I point people to the ACS data to get a more exact view. But uh, in particular, if you're looking for information about if internet is available in your community and who the providers may be, I, I definitely recommend going to the um, FCC uh, website to look at that. <clears throat> the other um, data is uh, one that actually uh, NTIA administers. Uh, the, it's to collect uh, digital nation data is uh, data that NTIA collects through a detailed service in um, in the census current population survey, and this actually is a deep dive into how people are using the internet, what they're using it for, where they're using it, and if they aren't using it, what are the barriers? Is it, um, are they interested? Is it too expensive? Do they have a computer? Um, again, this gives you um, a pretty uh, good look at sort of the usage. However, this data is only available pretty much at the national and state level. So I know, you know, since this is um, an at home and, and most of you um, work in local communities, maybe uh, to extrapolate the data. Uh, for example, if you know that you have a, a population that has um, you know, a uh, our seniors, um, uh, we know through the digital nation data that they're more like, much more likely to cite relevance as a reason not to adopt uh, and subscribe to internet, where uh, families with uh, school age children are much more likely to cite. So that will, um, you can use that kind of information to design your programs depending on who you have living in your housing developments and your community. Okay, so I'd like to emphasize that you really keep the community context in mind and really your community goals, the, the things that you want to see happen in your community should shape the analysis. I often see a divide um, between the data folks who are just focused on data um, and, and the people who work in the uh, programs, the ones that work maybe more closely with the community and maybe understand what the needs are. And so, again, there's a need to sort of translate some of these issues, um, such uh, these broader social and policy issues, such as the homework gap, aging in place, workforce development, into questions that then data can answer. But again, data is really at your service, and so, um, you know, data to drive 
I mean, you want your program goals to drive, drive the data analysis rather than the other way around. Um, I encourage that people um, combine the data that we've seen presented, the broadband adoption and computer uh, ownership data with other types of um, information that you may have. I referred to the uh, broadband availability uh, data. So, you know, you'll want um, people, especially in rural or um, a smaller communities, may want to know whether people are not subscribing because they don't have access, so there aren't providers, or is it because of other reasons? Um, also, uh, look at things like uh, employment, and educational um, data. Again, a lot of that's available through census, and also um, many, many local governments collect um, that data as part of their economic development and uh, workforce development um, planning. Um, I'd also uh, look at who the uh, providers of computer training and public com um, computer centers are, whether it's the libraries, community colleges, you know, the workforce training programs, um, and also looking at, um, you know, where's public Wi-Fi um, available. Again, data is just a tool. So even though I think it's really useful for um, Playing and again, um, the seeking funds. You uh, you still need the whole stakeholder engagement, the stories, the community outreach, and, and partnership development. And hopefully, again, this uh, the data analysis can help you in all of that. So to go more specifically, how you can use data, um, you know, I. I see a lot where people might implement new programs or they might deploy um, deploy Wi-Fi or they might deploy some internet um, without knowing whether they actually are addressing the um, areas that need the services the most. So you saw a really dramatic example in, in uh, San Francisco where you look at the really high level of uh, internet um, Internet subscription, but these census tracts are very, very low level. And so, you know, analysis that could be done are like, are computer sets there? Are there training programs? If you look at um, workforce and, and, and job data, are there workforce training programs that integrate, um, integrate into access? in the areas that, again, have low internet adoption rates as well as uh, low employment rates. Um, also, hope then, once you've identified the communities in need, you, uh, both you, uh, your you know, housing authority, or the local government can really uh, set priorities and prior prioritize uh, funding for those areas. Because it really becomes, um, with scarce resources, a lot of it becomes a resource allocation uh, issue. So if you can make the argument that, you know, that uh, certain areas are more in need, for example, the library is in a certain, um, certain area, need more computers because they have a lower uh, brand, um Description. Um, also, you can start using this for program design. I, I mentioned that there's a difference between maybe a program that you design for um, an area with seniors who don't subscribe, and that it might be more around training and um, showing people applications, like uh, medical applications and such, versus um, uh, an area um, working with uh, low-income families where really, uh, again, there's a high interest, but cost is a real barrier. So working more um, on those discount programs may have more an impact. And really, it's not only an issue of equity, which I think you know, people on this call are interested, but it's really about efficiency and maximizing the impact. You, know, you can use it to shape local policy. And also, I think these statistics become really compelling to build political stakeholder and community support. Um, and then, of course, uh, de demonstrating need, the need specifically with data for funders. Um, I've been a funder both in, in the uh, 
in the, for foundations as well as for government. And it is really compelling to have specific data and that you can demonstrate that your particular area has this high need compared. And this is really, again, um, probably impo most important or really important for um, people who are working in urban areas where, you know, the, the relatively high uh, internet adoption rate may mask the fact that there are these areas very much in need. I'll give a little bit of the context of the um, of the example that uh, Tyson used, um, uh, I was familiar with this. Uh, this, uh, in fact, address is of this uh, housing development called uh, Hunter's View. And when I used to be the uh, digital inclusion director of San Francisco uh, way back in, I think, uh, 2006, 2007. So uh, was when I first went uh, to this housing development. You can see the before and after. Um, uh, picture and at that point we were just do, to do some outreach efforts and training efforts around around digital training and they um, actually have rebuilt the site or they're in the phase of rebuilding the site and the first two phases out of three are complete and I know that they're looking um, they're now a digital inclusion um, program citywide program and they're looking at services there too um, and I think uh, you're eligible for the AT&T discount program there. Uh, I wanted to uh, lightly touch on another example that involves housing. And um, again, uh, this is an example of San Mateo County, which is located just south of San Francisco and is actually part of Silicon Valley. As you can imagine, it is a wealthy county, but the county government knew that there were still a number of people in their community um, left behind digitally. And, you know, in Silicon Valley, that's a huge, huge disadvantage. So um, they had a, or they have a public Wi-Fi project, and they want to use public Wi-Fi to address the digital divide and homework gaps um, throughout their county. So they actually used uh, the California broadband map, which includes FCC and some uh, state data on broadband availability with broadband subscription data, as well as the Purdue University Digital Divide Index, which I'll talk about shortly, to identify the areas most in need. And so they really set a priority list, to, um, and basically the top priority were uh, areas most in need, and um, I highlighted the example of the St. Uh, Francis Center, which um, affordable housing, youth, and education services. They did provide um, some uh, uh, internet capacity to this center, and also uh, have uh, partnered with a local, um, other local nonprofits that ha um, focus on the training to bring that to this um, this center. Also, talk about a couple tools, of course, um, and a couple that some other uh, people provide. Some people who have done sort of a first level analysis on the data that uh, that Tyson covered. The National Digital Inclusion Alliance is a national nonprofit that provides information and resources uh, to digital inclusion programs across the country. I highly recommend that you join their listserv and check out their guides. Um, their discount broadband programs guide is particularly, I found particularly useful. They've also developed a home internet map where they took some of the data um, that we saw before and developed an interactive map. So you can actually drill down to your own community and see the percentage of households with a, a cable fiber DSL, uh, for own census tract, or um, the households with no home internet. And this can really help you get started. I mean, I still think that you do a deeper dive um, using um, the data.census.gov and look at more information on demographics and computer ownership and how those all, all interact. But this will get you started. At least you'll know, you know, um, at a top level whether your community um, has some of these issues. 
And we let, um, I mentioned the Purdue University Digital Divide Index. Uh, Professor Roberto Gallardo and his colleagues at Purdue University have again taken and um, pulled together the um, not only the uh, broadband subscription data, but also um, combined it with the FCC availability data and also some demographics uh, that usually indicate that people are, um, are which people are more likely to be on the wrong side of the digital divide. So seniors, people with less than a high school uh, education, you know, low income or disability. And again, this is a, a, this shows Indiana and that's what's available on their website. But uh, I encourage people to actually contact Roberto if you want uh, information for your own community. Again, this is, I think, really useful for rural small towns or um, rural small towns or outer ring suburbs to help determine whether the low internet subscription rate may be due to lack of providers or just you know these other factors. Um, and you can contact me, I can get you in touch, but I've actually um, put him, uh, connected uh, a number of communities with, with uh, Professor Gallardo uh, to help them with the analysis and access to data. Uh, we're to help. <laughs> uh, we, we offer advice um, on, uh, on all these issues and we really, um, want communities improve their broadband capacity. And again, I talked about some of the things, you know, the, the, the tools and the guides, our webinars, and also I'm available to talk to uh, people as well. So um, please reach out. All right. Uh, Thank you, Tyson. This was so great. If, if I could applaud and you could hear me, I would do that, but I can't. <laughs> so thank you so much. I know I'll, I will turn it over to um, Janelle for taking any questions. So folks, if you have questions, please, you can raise your hand and Janelle will connect you over the phone. If you see like the little mitten in the middle of your screen, um, you can click that or you can type um, your question in the chat box. So please um, send us your questions. Okay, Janelle's line just dropped. Um, so she, if you guys have questions, if you could use it, use it, um, send it into the chat box, and I, I should be able. This is Dina. I should be able to um, see your questions. I guess maybe while we're waiting, I, maybe I can ask Tyson a question about the upcoming census. Um, Tyson, I, I'm not sure, I imagine you know about it, obviously, but um, can you talk a little bit more about when it'll come out um, and the types of, I, I imagine they'll also ask questions about broadband availability, computers, et cetera, et cetera. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? can speak a little bit to the census um, in terms of the 2020 census. That yeah, that's what I was asking about. Yeah, the question's on the population. So it's basic demographics. It doesn't include any kind of broadband or internet. That's only through the American Community Survey. But it is a huge time for us here at the Census Bureau as making sure we get 100% population count, counting people once, once and in the right place is very important um, in terms of the data being used and um, not only for kind of initial time, but over the course of the next 10 years. In terms of precise specifics on the schedule, I don't have exact details. I do know that this is the first census where we'll have online response as a first option. Um, you will, households will receive an invitation to complete the census online, but that's just an option. There will be follow-up, mailings, reminders, and then, of course, in person in follow-up if we still haven't received a response. But um, responding online is the most cost-effective way 
for us to get that response. So that is one thing we're pushing since this day is April 1st of 2020. So ramp up towards that time. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm glad you mentioned that about the uh, the various forms and how also that the preference is going to be for an online response to the 2020 census. Um, Point. I did want to mention to everyone on the on the line that uh, we will have representatives from the census at uh, the upcoming Act Home USA Summit. So uh, please please uh, stay tuned for that. But um, you know that's another benefit of of attending the summit. So we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Um, chat box or online? Actually, I also add a comment to mm -hmm. as. Um, I've been talking to a lot of local governments in particular who are ramping up outreach efforts. Again, the concern is since at least the initial um, way to answer is online that you know people are concerned. So there is um, a lot of planning going on around uh, helping um, do outreach uh, in areas that are are. Um, are less likely to have um, internet access, and in fact, a lot of people are using this data to do that kind of targeted outreach. So it may be something that you want to um, engage with your local government, um, you know, whether municipal or county government, about. That's a really good point. As a reminder, um, you know, the federal government bases a lot of the funding decisions on the population, so it's really important uh, to, to get a very accurate count, and we certainly want to make sure that we're counting those who typically are underserved, and to Amy's point, those who might not uh, be uh, likely to answer a census uh, near online. So uh, the work that we all do in Connect Home USA is very important and will be you know, continue to be important, in the, especially in this space. So um, I will turn it over now to uh, Janelle, who I know is back uh, on the phone, to see if she has received any questions that I may not have seen. Yeah, sorry about that. Can you hear me clearly? This is Janelle. Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. So the only question I've seen that has come through the chat box is if we are able to get a copy of the presentation, um, flash handout. And again, we do upload all of our materials to HUD Exchange following the webinar. Um, but we'll also email out a PDF copy. Um, it just takes about a couple weeks to get it onto HUD Exchange so that we're able to get it into um, body compliance for um, ADA. Um, those are the only questions I've seen so far. I'm not seeing any hand icons raised. Again, you can ask question by using the hand icon or sending us a message in the chat box. Um, make a comment because I think I powered through <laughs> through a couple points that um, just because I was worried about the about the timing um, and highlight one example um, I know I've been working with King County and what one interesting approach that they've done is that um, a lot of uh, a lot of places a lot of again local uh, um, Low governments have been uh, putting together metrics for themselves. Um, so one metric that a lot of people use is, is you know, total um, for uh, this field is the uh, total uh, number of people in their community that uh, subscribe to broadband internet. But then, as I I mentioned, the concern is that that mass the divide and, and it, you know it's again in making a compelling case for funding and to funders. Um, I think a lot of people who who uh, work in these um, areas that may be overall, again, their income, but have these areas of need, um, need the case about the gap. So um, in this case, they've actually formalized um, the uh, the cutchen or the measurement of the gap between the areas with the highest and lowest broadband adoption as a key performance metric that they need to resolve. So, for example, two communities may have an 8% uh, internet adoption rate, but if one 
one um, one company has an um, areas with 60% and then 99%, and then the other has another example has 80% drought. Um, then you know when it's not the same thing, um, and that um, things like King County are actually looking at that. 40% divide and saying one of the ways that they're going to measure the success of the county is by actually closing that gap. So it may be also something to think about as you um, approach, again, local policy holders as well as uh, funders like community foundations that may be looking um, uh, have a regional approach to um, addressing the dual divider addressing poverty issues or addressing um, the homework gap. And that's really helpful. Um, and it, it sounds like, you can, based on what you and Tyson said, that the, we can really drill down to very, very localized areas to get really good information and be able to compare uh, one area of a city to another, for example. Uh, so I think for our, for our communities, that's really good to be able to see. So they, you know, the, the city de decision makers might think that the city has a pretty good adoption rate, but uh, until they learn that maybe the communities that we serve really uh, are, are quite different. So um, this is really good, good information. This is what's been really exciting about uh, the release of five-year data, because prior to that, we weren't able to drill down. So it's a, it's a huge step forward in the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. awesome. I guess I, I would ask um, if um, Janelle, if there are any other questions, because we are at three o'clock. We received any other questions? Oh okay. well, uh, we will, as Janelle said, send out the PDF, and that we can do uh, very soon. And and if folks want to uh, rehear this webinar. It'll be posted on uh, HUD Exchange. So I want to thank all the audience for participating and, of course, our wonderful presenters for the great information that you provided. I know you're, you, you listed your contact information, so if folks have questions, I'm sure they can reach out to you. And many thanks to Janelle for helping us coordinate this great webinar. So thanks, everybody, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye.